Hello everyone, thank you for joining us for this session on keeping digital patient records secure. I see quite a few people uh, in the chat already. We've got people from New Zealand, uh, around Australia that I can see so far. Thank you for joining. I'm going to straight, jump straight into it. It's a little bit different to um, some of the sessions we've done in the past where I'm, I'm just going to run you through really it, it's some tips um, as the topic would suggest to help you uh, keep your digital records secure. And I think that um, hopefully it's going to be useful to you whether um, you're using Clinico or not should not matter. These, these tips are really um, designed to be universal for you. So I do have some slides that I'll bring up and hopefully you can see now. Um, and I'll jump straight into it. So for people that aren't familiar with who I am, um, so my name is Joel and I'm the founder of Clinico. Uh, my background is in software development and I've been working on Clinico now for about 10 years. So in that time, um, I've had plenty of opportunity to uh, meet with lots of healthcare practitioners, talk about them, about their digital needs and understand how they're working and storing patient records electronically. And I've learned a lot in this time about it. And that's where I've sort of come to this information I wanna share with you today to hopefully help you out and make sure you can keep those records of yours secure. Now, during this session, the advantage of doing a live stream like this is you can ask me some questions and I can answer them as we go along. So I can see Martina mentioned already to post. They don't have to be difficult questions. They could just be questions. Um, but do use the YouTube comments there and put your questions in there for me. Uh, and I'll be able to follow along with those and try to cover off on them as we go through this. So I'd like it to be as interactive um, as you'd like it to be. If you have questions, feel free just to put them in there. Also, so you know, um, this recording here, um, this will stay in this spot, this will stay on YouTube and be available to you afterwards. So if you need to leave early or there's some things you want to come back to later on, uh, it, this video will just be available afterwards for yourself to watch or to share with others if you're inclined to do so. So um, you don't need to worry about uh, missing anything through this. So I want to get to the core of what this topic is about key keeping your record secure and there's a fundamental principle that's important for you to kind of be aware of because it, it can help sort of dictate how we go about our secure measures. And that is that people that want to hack your data <clears throat> are typically doing so to make money off it in some way. And they are busy. There's so many people in the world that they would like to hack and so many people with vulnerable data they would like to take. So they need to be very careful and very picky on who they spend their time trying to hack. It's quite a problem that they have. And we can see this in a, a pretty common um, scam that's known around in the world. I'm assuming people watching this now, you're familiar with the Nigerian print scam. So this is an email that gets sent to you, probably from a Nigerian prince, and they effectively have all this money to give you and they need you to go through some steps to receive this money. Now you might receive an email like this and think that's ridiculous. Why are they still saying they are a Nigerian prince when everyone knows the Nigerian prince email is a scam? Now these people aren't stupid. It's not that they don't know that. They do it for a very specific reason. The reason they still say they are, are are a Nigerian prince, which for some reason is very hard to say today. Uh, the reason they say that is because they know that most people are aware of this scam. Most people know it's a scam. Most people, as soon as they get that email, will delete it, will spam it, will whatever. They won't even consider to respond to it because it is so obviously a scam. Except for those few people that are particularly vulnerable, particularly um, you know, at risk of falling for a scam like this, maybe they're not aware that this is a scam and those people will still receive this email and they will still respond to it. If no one was responding to these emails and no one was falling for this scam, people would stop doing it. But we still see this coming out. And what it actually is, is very careful targeting to only spend their time on the people they think are most vulnerable and most likely to fall for the scam. If they send this email out to 10 million people, they can't afford to respond and correspond with all of those people only to find out that most of them will never fall for the, the part at the end. So they use it as gatekeeping and they're really trying not to waste their time and to only find the people that are most likely to fall for it and they're the ones that they're going to target. That's the reason that they're still using the... Nigerian print scam. So what this is really about is how to make yourself less of a target. Um, that's the best thing you can do when they're going to pick who they're going to target to attack for you know their malicious activity. We want to make sure you're not one of those targets. Now there's a couple of ways you can go about it. So the first option is you can improve your security. 
which is, you know, we're going to go over some things and what that actually means. But you can go out there actively and you can improve your security so that you're less desirable to target for these activities. Alternatively, you could sabotage others and make their security worse so they go for them, not you. I'm going to focus on the first bit. I'm going to focus on improving your security. The other way, uh, to be honest, is a lot harder. You know, it's very hard to go sabotage all these people and probably it's a little less ethical as well. So what we're going to do through here is work out how can you be less of a target by improving your security. The other thing that's important to know with this is this is not like a hugely technical uh, bit of information here. I want to focus on the things that are really easy, really actionable, really simple for you to do that you can implement right away and makes a massive difference to the security of your information. If you do these things, you know, we probably could finesse the edges with some really technical solutions, but for the most part, you're pretty good if you do these. And as you'll see uh, very soon, um, they're quite easy to do. And I'll explain in detail practical steps for them all. Now, I do see um, a question that's come through. It's kind of um, around a bit of privacy legal. I might come back to that one, Shane. I see that question, but I'll stick to the sort of topics that I've got here at the moment. And then at the end, I think I'll field ones that are a little bit outside of this because uh, it's more about the sort of rules and regulations as opposed to the security of it. And that's to do with um, emailing health information. So I'll come back to that. So the number one thing that... Um, I really want people to be aware of, and it seems like an easy thing and it's easy to neglect, is installing your security updates. So what I'm talking about is on your computer, on your Mac or PC, I'm talking about on your phones, if you get a security update or an update to the operating system or to some of the software applications you're using, uh, often these updates come out to fix security vulnerabilities. And the problem with it is when they fix these vulnerabilities, they kind of announce them. So malicious uh, hackers around the world become, all become aware of the vulnerabilities that were there. And they know that anyone that doesn't update will be vulnerable to these attacks. So it's kind of like the, the easiest thing you can do is just to install these updates when they pop up and they will harass you. You'll know it on your computer. You get messages popping up all the time saying there's an update, there's an update. And too often we press snooze tomorrow, next week, not now. Um, but really, this is the number one thing that's going to make you vulnerable uh, to an attack is not doing these updates. Even um, we've had it a lot in Australia, and I know it's happened around the world, is people are getting these ransomware attacks in their health businesses. We see it in the news all the time. Someone's had their, their business attacked. All their data has effectively been encrypted or hidden from them, and they need to pay a ransom to get it unlocked. And I have yet to see a case where this has occurred and it hasn't been exploiting a vulnerability with these software updates or not applying the updates. And what I mean by that, to be very clear, is if these businesses had put on their updates, they would not have been hacked in this way. It would have been the prevention. And most of the hacks of this type are just abusing old vulnerabilities that you don't need to be susceptible to. So obviously on your clinic computers, on your business computers, make sure all the updates are done and on your personal computers as well and on your phones. This is my number one tip for you. Install those updates, don't delay them and it will protect you from a large amount of automated attacks that happen on the internet. As far as actually doing it, if you haven't already, and I do believe it comes as a default anyway on a Mac, you can, uh, you can do automatic updates. You just tick it and that's what's going to prompt you and ask you to do it. And you can do the same on Windows as well. You just turn on to have automatic updates and your system will prompt you to do so. So I really recommend make sure they're set to automatic. Do it on all your devices. And if you hear in the news about these ransomware attacks, this is the exploit. This is what that they're honing in on to get access to people's computers. And this is how you can prevent those kind of attacks. It is notable as well, if you're using Clinico or a cloud-based system like ours, even if they did get onto your computers and do this type of thing, they wouldn't be able to encrypt and uh, you know, deny access to your information if you're using a hosted service like ours and others that are similar to it. But even still, even if you're using Clinico, these updates are really important. The next thing I want to talk to you about is passwords. So you probably guessed that passwords are a key part of security in any digital world. And something that you can consider is what could people access if they had your passwords? So what sort of things can they gain access to? What can they do damage with? A lot of times people might think, you know, they're banking, or you might think, you know, your practice management software, if you're using some and you're storing patient records in it. And these are both very legitimate and important things. But one that's kind of underestimated is your email. 
Um, protecting your email and having a strong password for your email is super important. And the reason for this is most services you use will use your email as a fallback if you've forgotten your password. So if you forget your password and you go to login and you cannot, you can say forgot my password on most services and it will just email you a link to set a new password. So if someone has access to your email, they can do that and they can reset all of your passwords. Not only that, probably in your email is a whole list of emails that have come from all the services you use. So if they have access to your email, they can find out what services you're using because you get emails from them and then they can use the email to reset your passwords. So really important to have a very secure password for your email, as well as the other services that you use and know would require um, high security. The next thing with your password, and uh, again, kind of an obvious one, but also one that we typically statistically do poorly on is, is your password easy to guess? So there's a few different parts to it. The obvious ones, and I think we've sort of, as a society, come to know this, that uh, putting your date of birth, putting your child's name, your pet's name, things like this that other people could guess easily, your favourite uh, football team, whatever it might be, those sort of things are not good because they're guessable. There's another type of guessable password, and that's just the most common passwords that people use. So in 2019, these are the most common passwords used. And the way this is found is because a lot of systems do get hacked and the password information gets shared and security analysts can go through and do some statistical analysis on it and find out. Now, a large part of the reason that the numerical ones sit at the top is because a lot of this is global data. So in different countries, for example, the word password is written differently in different languages. It still does manage to float to number four on the list here, but the numeric ones probably sit a little higher than they would ordinarily just because they're more, they're more global. Uh, so they get used by more people. So it's really the ones with the words in it as well um, that you want to steer away from. And looking at the number of people that are uh, watching this live stream right now and knowing the number of people that use these common passwords, um, statistically, we have quite a few people watching right now that are using passwords on this list on the screen right now. Um, I don't recommend you mention it in the comments, but I would suggest that you go ahead and change those passwords away from these. And the most common patterns you'll see here Obviously numeric patterns, so one, two, three, four, five, six type thing, or people that are going really secure go all the way up to nine. Um, and then you've got keyboard patterns, so QWERTY, you know, those letters are in a row on the keyboard, or even then people are getting a bit fancy and doing a keyboard pattern that no one would ever guess, and they do one Q, two W, three E, and if you look at your keyboard, you'll see what that pattern is, that number 13 password there. So whilst it feels pretty tricky and you think you've done something quite unique, you know, it's in the top 15 most common passwords. Uh, and there's some other keyboard patterns that are quite similar and high up in the list as well. So I would say do not just use a, a simple pattern like that that a lot of people might be using because anyone that tries to break in with your password will try the common ones first. So don't let that be one of yours. So that's kind of what not to do with a password. And I really want to have a look at what we should do. How can you make a very secure password? And there's an interesting sort of conundrum we have. And that is, um, you know, the way we've been taught to do passwords and the, the way we consider a password to be secure. So if you have a look at these two options that I've got here for you, we've got um, the first one there where I've been pretty tricky to write the, write the word secure, but I've included a symbol, lowercase, uppercase, a number, um, all these different things to make this a secure password. And then the other option I've got is just this short sentence, I love coffee. Now, before I jump to the next page, um, maybe just have a think to yourself and uh, you know, have a guess, how long does it take a computer to brute force crack each of these passwords? So if a computer's, you know, basically what it's gonna do is go through a whole bunch of combinations to try and guess your password, what is more secure here? We've got the one that's got the symbol, the uppercase, lowercase, the number, or we've just got all lowercase letters, but it's that short sentence there. Well, I'll give you a moment to ponder and work out how long. Let's have a sip of water and uh, see if you can guess how long it's going to take the computer to guess each of those different passwords. So I will break the suspense. What we've got here is that first password would take a computer, a powerful computer, to brute force it will take it five seconds to get that word secure with all those different combinations of letters, symbols, uppercase, lowercase. And the password, I love coffee, 
is going to take the same computer 2,000 years to crack. Now, even if you'd guess which one is more secure here, um, I still think that that's a surprising result for how long it actually takes. And what we found is that putting symbols, numbers, uppercase letters, lowercase letters into a password don't actually make it more secure. What it does is make it hard to, harder to remember. So you're more likely to write it down or forget it or reuse the same password everywhere because they're so hard to remember. Whereas if you have a look at the, um, the sentence one uh, down below, this one here, I love coffee, super easy to remember because surely everyone does. Um, easy to type out because we're used to typing words. We're, you know, it's easier to type on a keyboard, something like that often than all the symbols and numbers and things. And it is way more secure. Now the reason for this, the reason it's more secure is it really just matters how many letters in the word, in the password there are, how many characters you've typed, how long your password is. So when I talk about brute forcing the password, what a computer is really doing is they're just trying every permutation of letters, numbers, symbols to work out what your password is. So it's going to go, maybe it goes A, then it goes B, C, it goes through all the letters, then it adds another one and it goes through again. And it's just going through these permutations. So uh, because the, the thing doing so doesn't know if you've used symbols, numbers, letters, uppercase, anything, it's going to try them anyway. So whether you've used them or not, it's going to go through all of those combinations. That's why this first one, a powerful com computer can do this quite fast. It can get through with only six characters there on that word secure. It gets through it quite fast. Whereas as you start to add more characters, it gets exponentially longer for the computer to work its way through and to the point where even a short sentence like this is 2,000 years. So what I would highly recommend for your passwords is a short sentence. Use all lowercase if you like or capitals if it's comfortable, but not because you need to for more security. And just do something memorable, something that you won't forget and something that's longer. So when you're accessing your most important services, a short sentence, something like this, would be ideal to be a very secure password. The tricky part with passwords, and once you have this secure password, is that it is really important to use a different password for every service. And I will give you a tip in a moment on how to achieve this. But the reason that it's so important is if we have a look at a scenario where perhaps for your banking and for Clinico, um, so I was just reading the comments of uh, the YouTube chat there. Um, if you look at, um, you know, your banking, your clinical password, things like this that are really important. Let's say you use a particular password that's a super strong password for, for those different services. And then also you go to buy something online at a pretty untrustworthy shop that you know nothing about their website. And at the end, it's like, oh, if you want to purchase this finishing checkout, you need to create an account so we remember you. And it asks you to enter a password. And you always use the same password, so you put that same password into this site to do so with your email address. And then later on, that site gets hacked because that site is not secure. Now, the person gets all the email addresses and passwords from hacking that site, and they can try it elsewhere. And they can go and use that same email and password they got from the insecure site to use on your banking, to use on Clinico, to use wherever else. So this is the core reason why you want to use different passwords in different places and ideally never use the same password twice on two different sites. Now, of course, that sounds like that's going to be very hard to remember. You know, I probably have 100 passwords myself or 100 services that need passwords. No way I'm going to remember a secure one for all of those. And that's where there's tools that can help you. A tool like this one, this one is called 1Password. It's the one I use. I have no kickbacks or affiliation. There's others like it. There's LastPass and KeyPass and a whole bunch of them. But what they are is a password manager. And this one's aptly named 1Password because you have one password for the password manager and its vault, and it stores a password for each different service that you use. And then you don't need to remember them. So they're all stored in there, they're all easily accessible, and even better, if you install it onto your computer or your phone, it can automatically fill in the passwords for you as long as you enter that one secure password. So a tool like this is really the only feasible way you're going to have a secure long password that is different for every service you use. Uh, and I definitely recommend it. I've probably used 1Password myself for five plus years uh, and been very happy with it. And I find not only is it more secure that I have all these different passwords per service, but on top of that, it's actually faster because it enters the passwords in for me. There's a browser plugin. If I log into you know, a, a site on the internet, then it'll put the password in for me automatically and is actually quicker. And on top of that, I have it just set up to do a random 30 character string for me for each password. 
<clears throat> it generates the password, it fills it in for me. I don't even know what the passwords are, nor do I need to. I just remember that one password. Now, always there's a question that comes up with a tool like this, what if they get hacked? And it's possible. Um, I don't believe they have in the past, their job's obviously not to, but I think that your security is better using them even with the risk of them getting hacked than it is without using a system like this because it's impossible to be secure enough with your passwords. So of course there's a risk with something like this. I would say use a reputable one, um, but I think that you know the net overall security health you have will be much greater for using a system like this than if you didn't. Now you've got really secure passwords, you're using different passwords in different places, just make sure you're also protecting your devices with these. So that's thinking about things like your computer, your laptop, your phone, you know, all of these should have password protection to gain access to them. I know there's still a lot of people that don't put a password or a pin code on their phone, and that's problematic because your phone might have your email on it, and I talked about it before how important access to your email is. So if someone could get access to your phone and access your email and the things on your phone without a password, then I think that's you know, a really big vulnerability. So you wanna make sure your pin code is always required for the phone and you want a password turned on on all your devices. That's a really important thing. The next thing we have after a password uh, and the next best thing to improve your security is two-factor authentication which is often defined as something you know and something you have. The idea with two-factor authentication is that you can, <clears throat> if someone even has your password, they still can't log into your services without also having the item. So often for two-factor authentication, the item is your phone and you can either get a text message on it as a second factor, or you can run an app like Google Authenticator or Authy that's gonna produce codes on your phone uh, to, to be that second factor. So the main idea is, and often that hackings don't even happen in the country that you're in, is forcing them to have a physical item you have as well as the password, is as close to foolproof you, as you're gonna get with um, you know, not, someone not being able to get access to your system. So the way it can look, like I said, is you can have, you know, that first image there is Google Authenticator, it generates codes for you. Your bank might give you something like that HSBC one, where it's actually, you put in a pin code and it generates a code. That's the second factor of authentication. Or you might just be receiving a text message that you have to type in the number. All of these are just a way to verify that not only do they know your password, but they have something second uh, and something else as well. So some places you might consider to turn it on, internet banking, your email, as I've mentioned before, you can put it on Facebook, Dropbox, Clinico, absolutely, I recommend people turn on two-factor authentication. Uh, a lot of services now are allowing, and some are requiring 2FA, 2FA is the abbreviation for it, and I really recommend turning it on in as many places as you can. I can't imagine how someone's gonna get access to these accounts once you have 2FA on without directly attacking the provider itself, but you would not be the weak link at this point when you have 2FA and a strong password password uh, using these services, you've done your bit. Now I want to talk to you about um, encryption, but I'll just give just one moment and see if there's any questions so far on the passwords or the, the 2FA front. Please do add them if you do have. So encryption, you've probably heard of it, um, may not know exactly what it means or what it is. So encryption is sort of translating information on a computer to be unreadable by other people without a special key. So it's gonna convert it kind of to gibberish and there's a key that unlocks it. So you can have your computer encrypted, you can have a device encrypted, and then you can decrypt it with this key to be able to make the information accessible. As an example, with Clinico, so we store all of your information encrypted, which means when we actually ultimately store it on a hard drive on a storage device somewhere, we encrypt it so that it's gibberish, that if anyone ever got access to that server, they couldn't read it, without a special key we use to decrypt it when we present it back to you. So on your <coughs> Mac, for example, and I'll show Windows in a moment, it's really easy to just turn on encryption for your device. 
So these are instructions how to do it. But if you were to turn on encryption for your Mac, for your laptop or your computer, then you actually don't notice anything. You turn it on and what Mac does for you is it encrypts it behind the scenes, meaning the hard drive is stored in it all encrypted. But when you use your computer normally, you would never know it's happened. So you pretty much turn it on and then forget it's ever done. And it's just that bit more secure. And when I say bit more secure, <clears throat> specifically what could happen, let's say you lose your laptop and they need to put the password in to access your laptop so you're all good. Except if they open up the laptop and take the hard drive out, and the information is not encrypted on it, then they can just plug that hard drive into another computer and read everything off it. There's nothing protecting it if it's not encrypted. So that's where this encryption is a good idea. It protects the physical device if someone was to steal it. Even if you have your password on your computer, it wouldn't be enough. Uh, and your phones do encryption automatically, I should mention. So it's really for your, your computers, your laptops and your um, desktop computers. So on a Mac, you just go to System Preferences, security and privacy it's called file vault for mac and you turn it on and you're done and your computer is encrypted it looks like this that i've got just showed up there and again a reminder that this video will stay so you can look back at this part later if you want um, then we've got encryption for windows so you can go to search type in bitlocker that's what it's called on windows Go to settings, uh, BitLocker drive encryption, and turn it on. I think it is on by default on the latest Mac and Windows anyway, but I'm not 100% on that, and it's definitely worth checking if it's on on your devices. And it looks like this on Windows when you go to turn it on. Now, one thing to be aware of, there is one downside to encryption. And what that is, is that previously, let's say you were using your computer and your computer died, and it wasn't working anymore and you took it to the computer shop and they took out your hard drive and they could recover that information for you, they won't be able to get the information off it if it's, um, if it's encrypted. So when you do do the encryption, it will give you a key you could store somewhere that could be used to decrypt it or you just need to make sure that you have a sensible backup solution in place so that in that event, it wouldn't be a problem. I think that that downside is nothing compared to the security benefit you get. And particularly if you're storing uh, digital health information, then I, I think it's like just a, probably a mandatory, you must be encrypting these devices to do it because it is not safe and protected without. So in your business, <clears throat> PC, Windows or Mac, turn on encryption on all the devices, any laptops, any things. And I recommend personal devices too. Like I said, the only time it, you could notice it is if you had to take the hard drive out to recover something and it was encrypted. And even then you could use the code you get uh, to decrypt it. Or even better, um, you could have a, a backup solution, which I'll talk about in a moment. Also, I want to talk just briefly about safe web browsing um, because there's a lot of malicious things on the internet as well. And the most important thing to know is that <clears throat> if it's HTTPS, it is, uh, it's, it's more secure, but very specifically, it's encrypting your information from the time it leaves your computer to the time it gets to the server um, on the other end. And if it's not HTTPS, it's not. And it's quite easy for people to kind of snoop in the middle of your traffic if it's not. So as an example, if you were entering patient information on a site that wasn't HTTPS or your credit card information or any personal information you care about, it is risky to do so if it's not HTTPS or most browsers will give the lock symbol up in the top there. So this is just really something to look out for when you're on the internet. You wanna make sure anytime you're gonna enter anything you wouldn't like other people getting access to, you want to make sure it's a secure site. And most commonly I would say, we're talking, you know, maybe if you're doing any credit card payments on the internet, I wouldn't do it on a site that doesn't have the lock or HTTPS, and I definitely wouldn't be entering any patient information onto any page that doesn't have that as well. We've come a long way, and most pages or a lot of pages now do support it, but it's, it's not enough to say that it's safe just to go freely, and you definitely should have a look for it. The thing to remember, if it's not HTTPS, it's not secure. We did go through a little bit of a phase as well of browsers kind of hiding that address at the top from you. Um, so you didn't see it to be a sort of simpler user experience, but it looks like a lot of the browsers now are going back on that. And I think it's Google Chrome that's the first one that's starting to show the full address again um, to allow people to look at that address at the top, make sure they're on the page they think they are and to let them check for HTTPS as an example. So definitely worth looking out for. <clears throat> Now, when we talk very specifically about storing client records digitally, 
client records, patient information, confidential information does have it own, its own laws, and in different countries those laws are going to vary. So the most important thing <clears throat> I recommend with this is you've got to be choosing a software tool that you're storing it in that is built for purpose, something that is designed to handle your health records because there's a lot of generic tools that you can find and apps you can find that are available and not all of them are suitable for every single thing you might do with them. So you can use, for example, um, Dropbox maybe you would use to store some patient information, but it could turn out their terms of service do not meet the requirements you have in your country for storing it. So I would say just because there's an app for it doesn't mean it's actually appropriate or okay for you to use it. You need to do that due diligence and checks to make sure that it is. So obviously um, I'm a fan of Clinico. I think it's a good option. I know that um, we meet the requirements in the countries that we're in. So, uh, and that is you know, pretty much um, all the countries really at this point, uh, particularly we've gone out of our way for the rules for the Australian privacy principles in Australia, GDPR through Europe and the UK. We've got the Canada requirements, um, which I always forget the acronym for, P-H-I-P-E-D-A maybe. Um, and we've got HIPAA in the United States. There's, there's all different rules in all different regions. Um, we've got information on our support site on how we meet it and how we can help you meet the requirements for them. Um, but really you want to check whatever tool you're using, you know, Clitico or the many others that are in the space. I would recommend using a tool built for healthcare information because that's much more likely to be meeting the healthcare requirements. But you want to go that step further and actually look into it and make sure that they do and get some confidence yourself that this tool is not going to leave you vulnerable from a privacy or regulation standpoint by storing patient information in it. One example of kind of um, diving deep on it is um, Google Suite. So <clears throat> for a long time, I was under the assumption with um, Google Cloud and Google Suite that you couldn't use it in Australia um, you know, with the Australian privacy principles that it didn't meet the requirements. But they do have um, <clears throat> a white paper available that is um, there to talk about how Google Cloud can meet the Australian privacy principles. And interestingly, you actually need to go into your Google Suite account and turn on a setting that kind of makes them abide by the rules. So if you don't have a look at this white paper and if you haven't um, gone into your account and explicitly said, I need you to meet the Australian privacy principles, they do not. Um, and this is not very intuitive or super well known. And I know there's a lot of people that do store information in Google Drive via Gmail, Google Calendar, wherever it might be. So this is one example um, where you kind of need to dive deep and this is specific to Australian privacy principles and Google Cloud, um, but no doubt other services like it, they've got information on it. And this is where I say again, anywhere your patient information is going to sit, you just need to check that you're doing the right things from a legal standpoint with them. Now, I mentioned before um, to do with the encryption about backing up information, and that's a really important of keeping information secure, especially health records where in most countries you have a requirement to keep them for seven to 25 years or whatever the, the range might be in your region. Um, but So it's really important that you back up and make sure you don't lose information as well. So backing up, uh, hopefully most people understand what that means, but it's taking a copy of your information <clears throat> and storing it somewhere else so that if you lose the primary source of it, um, then you'll have access to the, the backup if need be. Something less done with backing up is testing backups. So I've heard of way too many cases of people that have been backing up their information diligently and with a lot of effort and trouble. So weekly they take a backup, they transport it off-site, they do minor backups at this period and then full backups at other times and they've got such a diligent backup plan that maybe they've been doing for years at some cost but they never tested it. And then when it actually comes to it where they've lost some data and they need to recover and then they find out, find out it was never actually backing up at all or it wasn't backing up in a way that they could recover from it. So for anyone that's actually doing backups at the moment and haven't tested your backups, I highly recommend doing so and better to do it sooner than later. It's important to encrypt your backups. Hopefully now you understand um, what encryption is like and what it means. So you wanna make sure the devices you back up to, whether it's a USB drive or a hard drive or something, you wanna make sure that you're encrypting those. And I've got some tips for you on that um, in a moment. Uh, you wanna make sure that you store them in a safe place and that's you know stored safely from physical theft or from natural disaster like flooding fires, things like that. You wanna make sure it's in a protected place. 
and you don't want your backups in the same place as your core data. Again, if there's theft or some sort of natural disaster, you don't want to lose them all together. They should be kept in different places. Now, as far as um, some tools to use, so you can use um, on Mac, there's just a software feature called Time Machine and it can automatically back up to a device. Um, you can back up to hard drive, external drive, external computer, whatever it might be, and it can do encryption for you. So that's something that you can use. Um, also, if you just decide to use like a USB stick like this, if you in Finder right click on it, you'll see there's that option there, encrypt USB stick. And that means that it will turn on file vault for the USB stick and it will just have seamless encryption. Now you'll get a passcode that you can store, but anytime you plug it into the same computer that you turned on encryption for, it will just work as normal with no passwords. Only if you try to use it on a different computer will it require that password to decrypt it. But that's a really good and easy way to do a backup and keep them encrypted. Windows has similar, there's things you can purchase that are sort of um, external hard drives that come with their own software that'll do backups to it and do encryption for you as well. And likewise, a really simple option for Windows is just to use a USB key and right click on it and turn on BitLocker and it behaves just the same. That'll turn on encryption for that USB key. It'll work always on this device and on a different one, uh, you'd be able to use the passcode that you get in generating that. Now, as a final point to all of this, they are all my uh, top tips for you, but as a final point, um, it's really important that you do it all. Um, the problem with it is, is that one vulnerability is all that's needed for someone uh, to be able to get access to you or do something malicious. It's not okay if you have all these really good passwords and all this stuff, but you don't encrypt, then that could be your vulnerability. Or you have great passwords, great encryption, but you don't turn on passwords on all your devices. You only need that one weakness here to be something exposed and something vulnerable. So with all the tips that I've gone through in this session today, then I would say, um, you know, just make sure you cover off each one of these points. Hopefully they're simple enough and hopefully um, it's something, you know, without a lot of effort you could do um, to go through and, and actually hit each of those points. Now, I see some a few questions coming through, so I'll just cover off on, on those and happy to answer any more that um, you have as well before we finish up here. So... Um, someone's asked about more details finding the setting for the Australian privacy settings on Google. So um, what we can do if, if someone on our team doesn't find it right away, um, we can just put in the comments of this YouTube video and we're going to do a blog post about it and we can include it there. We'll find the link that has instructions for turning on the Australian privacy settings in Google. That's for you, Philip. So we'll add that to the comments of this YouTube video and also our blog post. Um, otherwise, if you just Google <coughs> the white paper, um, I think it le leads you towards it or has a link to it in that white paper as well from memory. But like I said, we'll follow up and get that info available afterwards as well. And we'll email out to everyone on this list once that um, the recording. So if you've signed up and you got added to that emailing list, we'll email you this recording as well as the notes that go with it. <coughs> Um, so we've got um, from Jackie, um, how do you test uh, your backup device? So really when I say test a backup device, what I just mean is restore the information, make sure you can get access to it. So it, it depends on what you're trying to do with it, but if you're just storing it so that you'll be able to see it, go in and look through the files, make sure you can see them, make sure you can copy them back to your computer. If you're trying to load them into a particular software system, see that that's an option for you. So it really depends on what you're backing up. What I just want to make sure is that the backup is working. All the data you think you're sending to the device is going there and it's accessible and readable to you. So just have a look through them and make sure that that's actually in there for you. <clears throat> Lizzie has a, a comment, not a question, um, about two of in my brain, which... Um, I think, I think my brain is quite secure. No one wants to get in there. Um, it looks like um, we don't have any more questions coming through at the moment. Um, so it doesn't stop you asking them later. I know that a lot of people will also... Um, well, there might be a couple more coming through. But uh, people that are watching this later and not live, you can still ask questions in the comments. We will see them come up and we'll be able to answer you later on as well. Uh, our team will monitor the comments of this. So, um, you know, feel free to come back and add questions if they come to you later as well. Um, I'll just have a look. Uh, I've got another question. Um, do we need to back up data on Clinico? So this is a, always a tricky one to answer. So need, I would say no. 
because we do do backups. We live stream backups through the day. We do daily backups as well. We store it in different geographical locations. Uh, they're encrypted. We do all the things you would hope and expect from us in backing up the data. Um, that said, if I was using Clinico and I didn't know the company as well as I do, um, would I back it up for my own peace of mind? Maybe I would. Maybe I would still do some data exports and I would still store them with some regularity to have my own copy just in case. So I would say you don't need to, but um, for comfort you might want to. The only caveat with that is once you do start storing them, obviously the security um, becomes something um, <clears throat> Sorry, the security becomes something that's your responsibility and um, you know it's important that you're doing all these things, the encryption, the passwords, the physical storage, that kind of stuff. So no need. You can, you might want to for comfort, but make sure you're applying these tips if you do do so, and that's with the data exports. Um, do have a few more um, questions coming through. So someone said, can, we, can, we, can I explain the encryption key? So when you turn on encryption, um, it should give you a passphrase, like sort of like a long password automatically generated by your Mac or PC, and you only get it at the time you turn on encryption. It'll give it to you and it will say you might want to print this, write it down, store it in some safe place. When that happens, that's the one you can take and you only get one shot at it, I believe, to store it. And that's what you use to decrypt those devices. It's just a password and you'll be prompted for it if you're using a different computer. So a reminder, on the same computer, if you encrypted your Mac, you'll never be asked for it, only if that hard drive went into a different computer. But ideally, if you're doing backups yourself, you might not even need to recover that information. Maybe your backups are sufficient. Um, or if it's for your backups again, while you're using the same device, you won't need it, only if it goes elsewhere, and it will be that password that is generated right at the start. Um, Someone's asking, um, does Microsoft Cloud have the same privacy issues? Um, there is a, I'm just having a look here, there is a privacy fact sheet um, that comes with Microsoft Cloud as well. Um, I don't know the details offhand, but we can include that, um, we can include that in our notes and our blog posts afterwards. I see Matt from our team's got it handy. Um, oh, there, Martina's um, posted in the comments already um about it so she's got a link for you but we'll try to include those in the summary information at the end as well <clears throat> um, someone's asking about aussie clients the data stored in australia so with clinico um up until i don't know maybe a year ago or something however long it's been now we stored all um we had all our servers in australia and stored everyone's information in australia um, now we've launched some different environments and on sign up depends on your region, you'd get allocated to a UK server environment or Canadian one. Um, we have a few, a few environments around the world now to help with data sovereignty. Um, but unless you explicitly chose otherwise, then you would be, <coughs> excuse me, you would be on our Australian servers and you can also um, just double check with our support team if you're not sure and they could tell you um, which servers. In fact, you even see it in your address at the top of Clinico. Um, there'll be an AU if you're in the Australian servers or a UK or a CA that'll indicate where your servers are located. Um, we do use some sub processes to process data as well, some data in different places and we've got a list of that on our support site. If you Google Clinico sub processes, it'll give you details on that. Now we've got a question to come back to from earlier on that wasn't so directly related. Um, so this was Shane who asked, are we able to email client letters to other healthcare practitioners via Clinico legally and legitimately? So first caveat is the answer to that um, is gonna depend by the country you're in. So I'm more familiar with the Australian laws myself and I believe that you are not supposed to email healthcare information. It is deemed to be not secure. Even though it, it's, it's a quite a complicated one because email can be encrypted. When we send it from Clinico, we do encrypt it, but email is not guaranteed to have encryption. Meaning if the receiving servers and the receiving party don't support encryption, emails can fall back to unencrypted. And this is the problem with email security is that it's not guaranteed encryption all the way through, even though we kind of from our side will specify encrypted. So I believe that in Australia, you should not send health info via email. 
um, and that is the reason why. But um, in general, secure messaging in Australia is a little bit messy and there's a lot of work being done on it. So it's probably a bigger topic than, than I can cover simply now. Um, but, but my overall answer would be probably not for sending it. I'll just check there's no more questions coming through. Although, like I said, if um, you do have more later, you're welcome to add them and we'll still be able to catch up with them. I think that's all. So thank you everyone for joining. Really nice to have you along for this session. I think it's an important one and it's one we're really keen to help you with and make sure we support you from your side on keeping your information secure. Um, I know there's going to be a feedback survey available. Um, Martina might have it to link in the comments, uh, feedback for this session. But what would be really great in there as well, if you have a chance, is what sort of information and content uh, we can provide to you in live streams like this um, that could be helpful for you or your business. And if you let us know, we will do our best to support you and help you out with that. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, we will send you a, a link to this um, via email afterwards and also summary information in the blog, like I mentioned, and we'll update you um, when we have another session coming up as well. So thanks everyone and have a good rest of your day or night, whatever time it is for you.